I'll, I'll read because I just want to try to say everything I would like to say. Uh, so, um, oh, social inequality is undoubtedly uh, at the base of the lack of involvement of the so-called new audiences with, uh, with, with the contemporary music scene. Bull and Scharf not only highlights how the class inequality in the classical music profession in the UK is, is a reflection of the inequality found in both the production and consumption, consumption practices, but also stresses how the unbalance in these two practices are connected. This observation, along with the finding that the spaces where classical music is commonly performed and hence the cultural institutions with which these spaces can be identified perpetuate this inequality, are used in this paper to support the approaches that I have developed for some of my works in order to subvert social inequality in the contemporary music field. In particular, I will describe how my work as an artist mainly acts through two strategies, the first being an attempt to disrupt people's common thinking about social hierarchy, um, the second an investigation of direct ways to reach new audiences. Um, Four of my works will be illustrated in relation to the strategies uh, described above, along with the suggestion to assess their success. Uh, no doubt they came through pain, a composition for ensemble and audience I developed for United Instruments of Whistling, stresses the connection between real life and performance and narrows the distance between audience, uh, performers and composers. Frauisch Thiemann for piano and live electronics reveals to the audience details of the actual or pretended personal life of the performer. In Asif and Kimba, the electronics um, regulates intervals of time in which the performer sings and moments in which she converses with the audience and encourages them to share their childhood memories. Uh, White Masks uh, combines a performance and an audience visual installation to which the voices of, different, of the different audiences the project meets are recorded and later reproduced to synthesize different environments and compensate for loss due to migration. From the features of the projects described in the present paper, some conclusions uh, would naturally stem with regard to the effectiveness of direct contact and boundaries uh, abatement between the music work and new audiences. Um, so, uh, um, with regard to the first strategy, uh, since the certification of social classes uh, seems to be mirrored in the classical music profession at the performance level, the division between audience, performer and composer does nothing but reinforce the concept of roles segregation. Music depends on the social dynamics that are necessary for its production, according, uh, as stated by Born and Pusser. And through the use of interdisciplinary approaches, it is possible to make the energy between performers visible and audible for the audience. Music should consequently not be regarded as a set of practices, but rather as a field of relations as stressed by uh, Pope Alexander Alexander. Uh, therefore, it is the artist's responsibility uh, to be aware of how the connections and the social forms generated by a performance can be interpreted by the audience. Since music conjures up imaging communities, through the assign assignation of roles to performance and audience members, virtual and momentary, uh, momentary mm -hmm. activities can be shaped, which last for the duration of the performance, but that can nevertheless have a more long-lasting impact on those who experience them. If one of the aims of the performance is to disrupt the distinction between, between the roles and effective strategy, an effective strategy, strategy is then, to get rid of the physical division between audience and performer in the performance space. This was also an approach that Luigi Nona used and, and he uh, uh, approached this also uh, through collaboration, of course, with uh, Alonso Piano, so, with, uh, so that the two fields um, somehow, uh, there was a good interdisciplinary collaboration with that architecture. Um, but, um, and so, um, the, the audience is thus offered the opportunity to be part, although momentarily, of a group of whose uh, hierarchical distinctions are weak, and hence is more keen to be able to imagine this in real life too. Um, <coughs> I will skip the maybe more philosophical uh, part and, and move to the second uh, approach that are. Uh, oh, yes, well, I will just say that. Uh, also, technology and the use of uh, uh, synthesis and analysis of voices can be um, a, a, um, an effective uh, way to 
uh, suggest a connection between the performance space and real life. And in this regard, I feel uh, this uh, fact that this is connected to what was being said about the Bush uh, uh, project, about the fact that the kids just enter a situation without explanation. So there is no uh, transition between their sort of everyday life and the performance space and the performance. Um, so the second strategy is uh, uh, the way uh, of uh, the, the direct contact to, with new audiences. Um, technology can also be extremely useful when employed within the second strategy to obey the distance between the new audiences and contemporary music. The experience of sound production in a notation-free context can be very fulfilling for those who are not familiar with the musical language and notation. Uh, and notation. Um, so workshops for youth and collaboration with schools can easily be opportunities for this kind of discoveries and certainly contribute to narrow the distance between audience and classical music as well as empower youth from minorities. Um, thus contributing to encourage uh, their careers in environments where they are usually underrepresented, uh, such classical music can be. And well, tomorrow we'll hear about the, the, the UV sketch. Uh, and today also we heard about projects to this end. Um, through the use of uh, technology, contemporary <coughs> classical music sometimes also uh, overlap with the field of fringe music and as highlighted in Stephen Brown's book, it uh, is able to reach new audiences because perform in venues that otherwise uh, wouldn't be uh, within home <coughs> uh, con uh, contemporary classical music. Um, another way the art that artists and institutions can adopt to address new audiences directly is organizing performances in public spacing, spaces, taking care of keeping the entrance free. Um, one example, for example, is uh, the London Contemporary Music Festival that organized concerts and installations at the multi-story car park in Peckham years ago. Uh, the events were free and they were really crowded, although um, very delicate music like uh, Rachman's music was performed and uh, even with <coughs> overground, overground running, and so even in, in let's say, noisy environments. Um, another um, approach could be the one used by the LA-based Ensemble Kaleidoscope, uh, the pay-what-you-can policy. So instead of being completely free, people can just pay what they can uh, uh, to, to access the, the performance. So um, the first uh, project that I, uh, that somehow, well, it's not the first one, but uh, chronologically, but one of the projects where I tried to uh, you um, use the first strategy was uh, No Doubt Back and Kate Payne uh, that was performed by United Instrument for Listening. And this project, um, as it, um, one of the purposes was of this work was to disrupt the boundaries between audience performance and, and composers and to conjure up uh, an imagined imagine society with no hierarchical structures. Um, so I decided to focus on this objective, but to prove to the audience uh, um, how performance and real life are so intertwined that sometimes it is impossible to tell which one we are experiencing. So I decided to shape a piece so that it would originate from, from and end in an, an everyday situation. This decision was made on the assumption that this would favor the acceptance of the idea that the imaging of a hierarchical society not necessarily needs a performative context to exist, but on, on the contrary, it can also inhabit our daily life. The ensemble members were instructed to position themselves in the lobby before the start of the concert and engage in conversation with the audience on a pre-established topic. In the same space, the scores of some of the performers were arranged on stands as if part of a visual installation. Consequently, the audience had the chance to look at them and at the signs the musicians draw on them, thus glimpsing into an aspect of the music world that is usually concealed in a <coughs> After a few minutes, some of the performers, one at a time, started to go to the performance space, fetch their instruments, go back to the lobby and play. The noisy chattering then was interspersed with instrumental sounds, which gradually grew more and more frequent and ended up dominating the space. At this point, the audience started to listen and realized that the performance had started. The musicians who had been instructed to stay in the performance space started to play too, and the audience naturally moved towards the concert hall to take a sip. The musicians in the lobby went on dialoguing with the ones in the hall for a while, but later moved to the performance space and arranged themselves in different positions. 
The final stage of the performance entailed the, uh, the gradually um, more frequent inclusion of conversation among the performers in the hall, so the composition ended as, as it had started, thus we speak in voices. This conclusion eventually revealed to the audience why they had suddenly found themselves involved in the performance at the beginning of the piece, while still in the lobby and unaware that the concert had started. This experience proved very successful because the audience did not need to be instructed or guided, but naturally moved between one space and the other. They were offered the chance to talk with the performers and the composer to observe the music scores and to be an active part of the performance. The reason why I had suggested the topic to the musicians is that uh, so it would have been easier for them to start a conversation with strangers in that the musical material had been developed from the sound analysis of some keywords I had selected within the pre-established topic. The fragmented sounds resulting from this process were therefore a sonic transition from what was being discussed in the lobby and the purely musical material that followed and hence build the bridge between the everyday situation in which people talk and the performance. Um, other performances with audience participation rely on the audience's awareness of being in a performance and imply the need to conduct them uh, through it. Besides being much more risky than the one I designed as the improvised contribution of the audience is sonically fundamental for the success of the pieces, these performances deprive the audience of that state of unawareness, which is a necessary requirement of real, real life situation, and hence would not be instrumental to the social epiphany to which the audience, audience is accompanied while experiencing, experiencing this piece. Um, this year I, I work uh, on two more pieces uh, that uh, instead I focus more on how to um, disrupt the balance between performer and, and audience um, through the disclosures of actual or pretended details of the performer's lives. One is Kaunstein uh, for piano and live electronics. Um, this, uh, the idea of uh, building pieces uh, with this um, objective uh, came to me because I saw a few years ago a work by uh, Johanna Seidel and Daniel Kette uh, at Venice Biennale, um, where the Neue Repressoristen were singing uh, and they had screens where it, it was projected, uh, some of the aspects of the real life were projected from the side. Um, so I'm, I was the recipient of the Imo Music Car Commission and I collaborated uh, and came to this uh, with the pianist Senia Kostova for the creation of Farnish Team. And, and I asked Senia to record her voice while talking about the important female characters of her life. The recording uh, ran through the whole performance and was filtered live by the material of the piano. Uh, when we performed the piece at the Smokali Theatre in Dublin, my contribution was to regulate the filter so that the spoken material would just move from indistinct, indistinct material, which simply contributed to change the timbre of the instrument, to intelligible text that could uh, be understood by the audience. The high level of synthesis between the instrument and electronics was reached thanks to the arrangement of the speakers underneath the instrument and to the addition of the dry signal from the instrument to the output of the filter voice. Um, in a sense, the composition can be regarded as a, as a lead, uh, in which not only the, pia uh, the piano part is performed by the pianist, but also the vocal <coughs> the vocal part. Um, the second work that um, has this kind of uh, idea, there's this is Asik Ich and Kimba. Um, it, it, this, this work goes even farther. It was really a, an experiment for me. Um, in this <coughs> regard, I work with singer Natasha Lopez, and we, uh, she performed at Kunstgram in Stuttgart. Um, the vocal material in this piece is entirely developed from synthesizing the different parameter fragments of this text, of text that she, uh, she gives. In terms of formal structure, the piece alternates sections in which the singer sings to sections in which she sits among the audience, recollects some pretended childhood memories of hers, and encourages the audience to contribute with their memories. Um, the electronics is organized so that during <coughs> some parts, uh, a constantly and slowly varying gorgona is played, while the spoken sections are framed within sonic environments which for sparse become denser, as the first electing space words and later signaling the approaching of the new sound section. This structural setting uh, worked very effectively and managed to both create enough intimacy for the audience to feel comfortable in sharing their memories and articulate the flow of the performance 
so that this would be perceived as a unique section. The amount of contribution from the audience provided me a direct way to assess the success of the interaction between audience and performer. And since I was afraid of asking people to asking people to talk about the part of skill might provoke a rejection from the audience, I was extremely pleased to see that not only they contributed, but after the premiere, one of the audience members who chose to share memory even thanked me and Natasha for their performance. And certainly some choices contributed to create the necessary intimacy the audience members needed to take part in such an experimental performance. Um, performing in a small space like Postram was one of them. Uh, and a video, as you can see uh, from, from, from the picture, a video was projected on a metal sheet um, that alternated the images of the singer while performing and in her, uh, the singer in her leisure time. Uh, to the metal sheet, uh, I had attached transducers uh, to avoid using speakers uh, as uh, also um, a kind of approach to, uh, as a way to strip down to the minimal effort. Um, but uh, certainly the, the, the project that is more uh, uh, connected to the topic today yeah. <laughs> um, is Red Masks. Uh, I started this project with uh, Shelley Sesso Saladin and, and then um, Ines Rebello, a visual artist, also joined in. Um, so we, uh, we started this project um, on, on loss and transition. Uh, which entails a performance for Cello and Live Electronics and an installation to which the audience record their contributions on the project teams. Um, and all, both, uh, both uh, the installation, uh, the installation and the performance are uh, framed within the same visual installation. The voices which are recorded are later processed and played through the transducers attached to the metal panel so that they contribute to build a community of objects resonating with, with the memories and thoughts of the audiences the project uh, meets. Um, um, this project has been performed three times so far uh, in Huddersfield, in London, and in fact the most successful performance was certainly the one at that, that forum, <coughs> which is a public library in London, and, and it will be performed uh, twice more uh, in, the, in the next few months. Um, so, uh, in an increasingly individualistic society which is used to uprooting, the project aims to compensate for the loss of traditions, social relations and places that to accompany the audience to their transitions. Given the concept described above, since the beginning of the project, a question arose, that's how to reach displaced people. Um, in particular, I refer to people who had migrated or whose families had migrated or anyone who for some reason had the feeling of being addressed as the other. Esther, Inesh, and I uh, re reacted to this with the choice to perform in public spaces and we wanted all the performances to be free, so accessible. And the first performance, the premiere, uh, took place at Cosmic, which is a great hall. But um, although uh, the performance uh, was uh, free, uh, I mean, uh, theoretically accessible, we realized that a uh, university campus is not as accessible as a public <laughs> library, for example, so we changed we, we, we organized uh, the second performance at the public library. Um, so, although I had for a long time tried to collaborate with local schools from the southeast of London, none of them seemed to be interested in getting involved in the project. And uh, on the other hand, the Dutch for Lunch, besides being a public library, also hosts the Tide Mill Academy. And when we performed there, we had the chance to do it uh, for the children who had just finished their school day. Moreover, they also interacted with our installation during the days preceding the performance. Since the location we chose for it corresponds to a space they populate daily while heading to school. Um, you can see uh, on the right some of the kids interacting with our, our installations and on the, uh, on the left hand side you can see uh, Esther playing and the kids listening to her. Uh, this was just a shorter version of the whole performance. Um, it was uh, quite uh, interesting. Interesting because when the kids uh, approached the, the microphones, they were expecting to, to hear their voices. So we, we use that as an excuse to explain how it's not uh, it's not something that happens all the time and why they couldn't hear their voices. And also they uh, heard the, the, the sound coming from the big metal panel there, but they couldn't really figure out, figure out how this metal panel would sound. So we explained about the transducers and we encouraged them to touch the, the metal panel. So it was really 
uh, it was really nice and there was a lot of depression. So uh, for us too, it was really um, um, I don't know, uh, a, a, a moment in which we uh, asked ourselves, ourselves a lot of questions. Um, so um, so they also interacted with our isolation. Um, never, nevertheless, these were not the only uh, incredibly rewarding contacts we had with local communities. For a couple of days, Esther Inish and I decided to advertise our performance in the area through uh, giving away flyers at the local market. Um, so um, some of the people we met there asked us uh, questions about our performance and seemed to be at the same time unbelievably oblivious of the contemporary classical music uh, world and curious about it. Um, so there are multiple issues deriving from this approach. One of them is the amount of work with which the people involved in the performance have, have to deal. So we, we work a lot and uh, it was somehow um, uh, a special uh, occasion for us. So it was our project, so we, we tried to dedicate as much time we could for that. Um, usually, uh, artists are not given as much time to interact with the audience um, and to react also to the audience, uh, audience's question. Um, so they must uh, either be particularly devoted to the project or have been awarded substantial funding. The other issues uh, relates to the performance conditions. People who are not used to attend contemporary classical music events might not be aware of a series of rules that are usually implied. Some of the families who attended our performance at the Duff for lunch came in late or left early, and this occasionally caused noise and created some disturbances to the, uh, to the cellist who was performing uh, extremely complex uh, solo pieces. Um, the project could certainly have been developed differently. Um, for instance, the installation could have been set up at the Defoe Lounge while the performance could have taken place nearby at the Albany, at the theater, uh, with a more traditional stage audience settings. But nevertheless, the three artists uh, wanted to perform also for the people who generously uh, recorded their voices and who would not uh, have come to the theater. Similarly to how Trevor chose to perform on campus in places such as Westcom so that his piece could be listened to uh, by the people whose voices he recorded and included in it. Um, yes, uh, well, I, I'll just finish <laughs> and if there is any questions. things, but you brought up several subjects that we haven't had yet, so thank you very much for that. So, any questions? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question concerning this uh, Albany Studio piece. Uh, is this something that you should do, uh, so you should record every pianist who is going to play the piece, so you have to do it from the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it becomes some, uh, like a very, very personal object, mm -hmm. yeah. or or not. It can be a pretended object, to, to be honest, because uh, I, 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 you don't feel comfortable uh, with asking the performer to talk about their talent, right? So as said, you can also choose to make up the facts that never happen or people that never happen and impact it on your life. It's fiction. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's performance, not But I thought it might be interesting to um, share some of the aspects their life with people who are not necessarily aware of what the life of a performer, a performer is. Um, yeah. This brings up the idea of longevity also, because I saw you know, the last piece you say, 2016 to 2019, but really, no matter what, okay, I understand that each time that you have a program, it's going to be an improvement in some respect. So you can, you can have an intergenerational <laughs> specific works as, as well. Uh, I also wanted to just mention, I don't want to open a can of worms, I think we're all sort of uh, more kids school, but I, I mean, the whole idea of making these concerts free with days and times. I had an experience when I was co-directing a major festival that was both um, classical music, but a bit of few focus on contemporary music too. And traditionally, we saw that in the previous years with the Lutheran's director that they had very little contemporary music and they were very poorly attended because they were poor. And I was thinking, well, you know, if we make the contemporary music concerts free, maybe we'll get a, a better audience. And my co-director and he entirely agreed with me, but you know, so, but it's 
this riot going on. It was a disaster, and especially it was raining, because then everybody would come in, eat their lunch, open cans of gloves, you know, do a disaster, and the total, the fact that it was free and it was out of the rain, they would come in and, and, and basically use it as a, a shelter. Um, and, and weren't necessarily used in the, in the context of the festival. You would think that in the context of the festival, people would be a little bit more selective, but no, no. So I, I, I know it's a whole other topic, and, and for people who are involved in, in public programming, um, it's something we all think about. But, um, but I think the idea of public space, when it's outside of the arena, then, then it really becomes part of the paradigm. Yeah, I think I think it makes it makes it easier to just reach uh, some groups that I would otherwise you wouldn't, wouldn't be able to reach. But uh, yeah, I know the problem of the noise is big. I mean, when I went to the car park in Beckham, I was shocked <laughs> to listen to Guero. This pianist became like just just a visual yeah. performance yeah. As, at times. Then I started to I don't know. I just stopped being concerned with that, and I just. I don't know, enjoy the performance anyway. And we're still talking about it because they had such courageous programming. Yeah, so absolutely. it really left the mark. Yeah. Anybody else? And maybe Sharon has uh, has articulated the fact that all of our little sponges are <laughs> they need to be squeezed out with uh, we have a reception where uh, the goal is is that you all congratulate, or we all congratulate each other for having our hearts in the right place. Uh, but we will reconvene here on time for what I expect to be a very fantastic keynote at a quarter past seven. Oops, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> at a quarter past seven. Sylvia, thank you very much. That was very provocative and interesting. Thank you.